you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Exodus, chapter 6. There'll be a little overlap this morning from last Sunday, um, but I really couldn't proceed any further. And then with Mother's Day being next Sunday, I thought it would be appropriate to pick up the plagues um, after Mother's Day. Um, didn't want to, you know, <laughs> preach on the plagues on Mother's Day. Um, so, um, but... Um, so we're going to conclude with this odd section of scripture in the narrative story of Exodus, and that's the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. And, and today, um, I wore my, my son's baseball team shirt because I thought that uh, illustration about baseball is appropriate. Um, I played baseball and I helped coach and unfortunately we weren't able to make it to my son's last game uh, yesterday because of Love Lodi and I found out good news they won and Caleb of course is like they won without me and because um, you know for our, our Tigers this year um, they didn't have the greatest season they were three and nine um, and you know coaching nine and ten year old boys when they lose is a whole experience in and of itself. I mean, how many of you have seen a nine or 10 year old boy, or really kind of any boy, it doesn't really change when you grow up. I think all men really want to win, and when they lose, it, it kind of punches them in the gut. But, but man, when these little boys either strike out, or they you know, hit someone pitching, or they make a fielding error, or something like that, I mean, have you seen it? Have you seen their faces droop? Have you seen them just start crying I mean and sometimes the pressure is so much on these little boys whether it's from parents or these you know travel baseball team coaches that if they make one mistake they just crumble and they cry and they're broken I remember um, coaching Caleb's team when he was six and seven um, it was the Giants in Elk Grove and I remember there was this one kid who just would not swing the bat like would not swing the bat and I mean I'm throwing strikes and I'm going I was pitching and I'm like come on buddy you can do it you can do it and he just wouldn't swing and it dawned on me while I was pitching that the reason why he wasn't swinging the bat was because he didn't want to fail because if he swung and missed his parents were going to harp on him or so he thought and um, I went I said hey, hey, hey come here and I, I said hey buddy um, are you afraid to, to miss? <laughs> Just crying. And I'm like, buddy, it's a game. <laughs> like, <gasps> take a deep breath. And what you see in baseball, and I think in sports oftentimes, because the win and what winning is and what losing is is so clear and so crystal cut. It's easy to see um, how we approach life in sports. And that's why sports analogies and metaphors are often times so helpful because um, as we're going to see this morning that the people of Israel were broken in spirit and because of their brokenness they performed really badly and they didn't want to listen to what God was saying and oftentimes in baseball what I have found is that when I carry let's say I struck out the inning before and then I go to the mound to pitch well what I have found is that if I don't deal with my failure in the dugout Oftentimes that failure will translate in me performing poorly on the mound. And oftentimes, or if I get hung up on the fact that I'm doing poorly pitching, and instead of just concentrating and doing what is before me, I get stuck in my failure. I get stuck in my um, brokenness, and I therefore perform poorly. And oftentimes what we will see, and I've seen this with my teenagers, I've seen this with my kids, oftentimes when you see bad behavior, it's really at the root, it's something broken inside. There's something, there's, there, and that's why they say baseball is 90% mental and 10% skill. It's a mental game. And, and a lot of times in life, it's a mental game. Um, when we carry our brokenness, when we carry our harsh slavery or our harsh circumstances, when we carry that into the decisions that we make or our everyday life, um, instead of order, instead of beauty, oftentimes what we unleash on the world is chaos. And, um, and that's what we're going to see here. And we're going to see also how God reminds the people of God that God works through broken people. And oftentimes for us, brokenness is a uh, liability. 
And I hope what you see through the text this morning, that for God, brokenness is not a a liability because if God were to use anybody, he has to use broken people because let's just be honest this morning, there are only broken people. There's no other option. Now, we can fool ourselves sometimes to think that we're not broken. And maybe you've even seen the sign as you walked in Vintage Church, the new sign that says, bring your mess. And that might have made you go, what is that about? Because we're all messy. And yet sometimes in the church, um, we try to create a 90-minute brokenness-free zone. Rather than seeing that it's actually in our brokenness that God meets us as I read in Isaiah 66. And and oftentimes it's pride that makes us want to put on a smiling face. Have you ever been in that family um, that are arguing like cats and dogs before church? And then all of a sudden when you walk into the doors, it's like, how you doing brother or sister so-and-so, right? I mean, we one time did a video uh, on this very thing and we called it trading faces. And it was like, Um, this family arguing all the way. I mean, they're going back and forth and then they kind of put on this little mask and walked into the church building and said, hi, how are you doing? Oh, we're great. Best day ever. And then it's like, as soon as they walked back out of church into the car, they took off the mask and it was like, you know, cats and dogs. Has that anyone relate? Um, it, this, is, this is something that we, we, we wrestle with because I think we have a maybe misrepresentation of who God is. And, and I feel that in this text this morning, God's going to remind us who he is. And he's going to remind us that, um, yes, we may be broken people, but he is a big God. All right? And so that's really what we're going to talk about, that we may be broken people this morning, but God is a big God. And so if you have your Bibles, um, we're going to start in verse 1. And some of this is uh, review, um, but I want to get to um, the end of this little section, verse 13. And I want to stop there, and then we'll pick up the genealogy. And we're going to finish chapter 6 this morning. And then we're going to um, have our women of Exodus on Mother's Day, and then we're going to go into the plagues and the Passover and good stuff after that. But in verse 1, it says this, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And just want to pause there and say this, that um, in some Egyptian text, um, there seems to be this picture of the Pharaoh as one who has a strong hand. And whether it's a strong hand or an outstretched arm, Pharaoh was perceived as, in Egypt, as one who was above all. Who there was no that com- no one else compared to Pharaoh. That he had a strong hand. And, and we see some of that even in his um, laying on the burdens and taking away the straw or even killing the firstborn. And so um, Pharaoh saw himself as a god. A, 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 really that there was no one like Pharaoh. And, and I think Moses picks up this language. I think God uses this language to basically tell um, Moses that you think think Pharaoh has a strong arm? Well, let me tell you, I have a strong hand and an outstretched arm that doesn't even compare. There is no one like me. I'm telling you, Moses, that his strong arm looks like a noodle arm compared to me. There is no match, no competition. So he's setting the stage. He's saying, um, because remember, Moses in chapter 3 and 4 was like, God, I can't do this. And then he gets a little bit of courage to go um, to Pharaoh and says, let my people, let the Lord's people go. And he's like, no, who's Yahweh? Who is this Lord? And he's like, please, would you let him out? And he's like, no, I said no. And then you guys have too much time on your hands. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you more work to do. And so he crushes the people of Israel. And so right now it's, it's at this dilemma. The conflict is real. The tension is real. Is God going to deliver the people of Israel? And so the Lord reminds him, I have a strong hand and I am going to do this, Moses. Look at verse 2. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Now, if you like to write in your Bible, I would encourage you to write in this section of Scripture the five times that he says, I am the Lord. Because he is going to, all over the place in this text, pepper this phrase, I am 
the Lord. Because as we have learned, as we've been going through the book of Exodus, this is essential to the Exodus story, that the Lord is going to reveal himself. He's going to reveal his name to the ends of the earth. And, and I think right now, he's like, before I do that, though, Moses, I'm going to have to reveal my name to you again, because you seem to have forgotten that I am the Lord. And so in verse 2, he says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Remember, that's I am um, Yahweh. I am, I am that I am. I am. Um, I am the self-existent, uncaused cause, the omnipotent, omniscient. I am the creator. I am the sovereign who's reigning and ruling on high. I am the Lord. There is no equal. That is my name. Verse 3, I appeared to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, but my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Now, I, I touched on this a little bit last week, but um, it, it seems to be that in Genesis, they did know Yahweh. Um, but what he's saying here is that they did not know my character. They did not know the extent of my power. They did not know the extent of who I am. And I am about ready to reveal this to the earth through this deliverance plan, through this rescue plan, through this Exodus story. But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. It doesn't mean that God forgot the covenant. What it means is, is that I am faithful. If I have promised something, then I will finish something. I am God. I am Yahweh. If I have made a covenant, I will remember my covenant and I will make do on my promises. And so then we have here again in verse six, say therefore to the people of Israel. Now remember, as it's going to say here in just a few verses, the people are broken. They are just crushed under the weight of their circumstances and oppression and slavery. They are crushed in heart. And I'm sure you've felt that before. We're just circumstances of life. I'm sure that in the last two years, all of us at some level have been just absolutely crushed by the weight of everything that's been going on. It just can seem overwhelming. And so what does the Lord say to Moses to say to the people? I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And he says six things that we're going to come back to in a little bit. But he says six things that are very important here. He says, number one, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. And I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So sandwiched between these two statements, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, are six statements of what the Lord will do. And peppered all throughout those verses are other instances or incidents of him saying, I am the Lord. He's basically saying all of this will come to pass. Why? Because I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And this is what you need to bring to the people. Who am I? Verse 9. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel. And here's where I want to just camp for a little bit. Look at this. So Moses got the pep talk, right? All right, this is Yahweh. We've been here before. This is Yahweh. Um, I'm, I'm going to go bring this to the people. But look at verse 9. <clears throat> Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. Did you catch that? Why did the people of Israel not, Denise, um, can you mute the mic? Thanks. Why did the people of God not listen to Moses? 
I mean, Moses just laid it all out there, right? He said, this is Yahweh. He's promised these six things, and it just was amazing. I mean, they've seen some of the power of Yahweh. They've seen what he had done with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and yet all of this was amazing. It was true. It was good. It was beautiful. It was hopeful. It was inspiring. But why could they not listen? They were broken in spirit. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been where there's just something broken within? There's something cracked. There's something upset. There's something not at peace. And no matter what, no matter the encouragement, no matter the instruction, no matter anything, it just, you can't listen. It just bounces off. Have you ever been there? And I think sometimes we, we our spirit is willing but our flesh is weak. Do you remember that story in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was praying with his disciples and he asked them to do something simple? He said, would you just pray with me? I mean, Jesus is over here sweating drops of blood and then he has his three closest friends, his three closest disciples, and he's asking them to just pray, just stay watch. And what does it say? They fell asleep. They couldn't listen. Why? Because they were broken. They were weak. They were frail. They were fragile. They were human. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And oftentimes we fail to recognize that our own brokenness, our own human fragility, our own circumstances can actually impact our obedience. I mean, have you ever seen... Um, when someone's just hungry or, you know, the, the joke is they're hangry, right? They're, 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 they're acting out, they're impatient and they're angered and they're just short-tempered and it's because they're hungry or they're tired. And you're like, that doesn't sound very spiritual, pastor. Well, maybe you'll recall the story of Elijah who after winning a great uh, victory at Mount Carmel, um, I mean, he showed up, God showed up, showed off. It was an amazing time. And then Elijah, because of one woman's little um, threat, said, I got to go. And he ran away. And he's like, I'm going to die. He had suicidal thoughts after this whole situation. God showed up powerfully, and Elijah's about ready to end his life. And God says, dude, take a nap and eat some bread. And then, as that comes through, he then goes to a cave and he says, listen to my still small voice. Because oftentimes, when, when our physical circumstances are just so overwhelming, we can't even hear the voice of the Lord. They can't even listen to the Lord through his servant Moses because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. And this is at the heartbeat of a lot of ministries that feed the homeless. That you feed them food. Why? So that then they can listen to the bread of life, right? Because when somebody is just absolutely crushed in heart or in spirit, they cannot hear. And I think that's what we need to take from this text this morning is that, um, I mean, it's so easy to just look at the Israelites and go, what a bunch of losers. Like, what, what a bunch of, like, they have no faith. They can't do anything. They're always complaining. They're always arguing. They're always not listening. They're stubborn and stiff-necked. And, and some of that is definitely true. But, but in this moment, I think the text high, highlights something that's so key. They were broken in spirit, and ha their harsh slavery prevented them from listening to Moses. Now, I want to draw your attention to a New Testament text that captures this in the book of Hebrews. Um, it'll be on the screen behind me, but if you want to turn there, it's Hebrews chapter 3. Um, in Hebrews chapter 3, um, we have that right, Denise, on the screen? We don't? I didn't put it on there? Oh, my bad. Um, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. This is the writer of Hebrews' admonishment to the people of God because this idea of a hardened heart or um, a broken heart or a broken spirit, it is detrimental to us obeying and following God's purpose in our life. And so in chapter 3, verse 12, look, look at what the writer here says. He says, take care, 
And the first thing off, you have to go take care, which means this is important. Take care, my brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. He's talking to followers of Christ. He's talking to worshipers of Jesus. And he says, listen, I want you to be careful, brothers, that you don't have an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Well, how would one get an evil, unbelieving heart? Well, it says right here in verse 13, well, he gives us a remedy first in verse 13. He says, but exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. We'll get to that in a minute. But none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There it is. Our hearts become hard and they can progress to an evil, unbelieving heart. And that can lead us to falling away from the presence of the Lord. How? By allowing the deceitfulness of sin to harden our heart. What is the deceitfulness of sin? What is the deceitfulness of sin? Remember that Satan's native language is lying and accusation. When we buy the lies of the evil one, when we allow our circumstances to determine and define and dictate our reality or even our identity, we are buying into the deceitfulness of sin rather than taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ and putting it up against the standard of the gospel of what is ultimately true. And so when we are... Um, a victim of the deceitfulness of sin, it is easy for our hearts to go down a path that ultimately can lead us in bad places. And I feel like with the um, people of Israel here in the Exodus story, they have definitely been hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. They have been hardened. Maybe it's like, well, God, you have forgotten us. God, you are for them and not for us. God, I mean, we, we play these stories and these lies and these narratives get trapped in our heads. And then sometimes we just buy in, hook, line, and sinker. It's all, we just swallow the whole narrative that the enemy is playing in our heads over and over rather than looking to the truth, rather than looking to what does God say to Moses here? I am the Lord. That's the truth. That's the ultimate meaning. That's the thing that should define everything. Not our circumstances, not our brokenness. We're afraid of our brokenness, I think, also. And we, 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 that's why we put on our fig leaves. Think about Adam and Eve when they first experienced brokenness. When they first experienced sin, guilt, and shame, and fear, what did they do? They covered up. They covered up. They put fig leaves. And, and I think sometimes our fig leaves sometimes even look like church clothes. We cover up because we are terrified for people to see our nakedness and our brokenness and our problems and our broken and crushed spirit. And so we cover up. And yet it's in James that it says, confess your sins one to another, that you may be what? Not forgiven even, but healed. There's something about walking in the light that we can have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. And so what is the um, remedy here for a hardened heart and the deceitfulness of sin? What does it say? Verse 13, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. That means that every day we should look to exhort one another. And I think that's exactly what the Lord is doing here in Exodus chapter 6. He is exhorting Moses to exhort the people to remember who God is. That he is the Lord and that he will do what he said he will do. So let's go back. I, I actually call this um, stirring the chocolate milk. Um, who has ever, my kids love chocolate milk. My kids absolutely, well, they used to. They're not like the biggest on it now. Now it's Dutch Brothers or Starbucks. But when they were little, they absolutely loved chocolate milk. And I, and I just couldn't go to the store all the time and get like the, the chocolate milk. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I don't want to make individual glasses of chocolate milk. So I'm going to get a gallon full of milk and I'm going to put the powdered chocolate milk in that container and then I'm going to stir it up and give them chocolate milk. But you know when you put it in the fridge, what happens? 
it settles, right? And it doesn't look all that great. And so you have to stir it. It's kind of like what the Lord is saying in Hebrews chapter 3. You have to stir up your faith. Because over time, the deceitfulness of sin will just begin to settle. And if you let it settle too long, it will harden. It will harden. And then it will eventually lead to an evil, unbelieving heart. And does that mean you don't believe in God? No, what it means is functionally, you forgot his promises in your everyday life. And so you just function. You just go on with living. And your brokenness becomes a pathway to falling away from his very presence. And if you've ever found yourself in life where you're just outside of the presence of God, I would encourage you, are you stirring the chocolate milk? Are you exhorting one another daily? And are you being exhorted? And I think, church, if we want to fight against hardening hearts, if we want to fight against the deceitfulness of sin, then we must exhort one another every day. And that really doesn't fall all on the pastor. That's all of us together. We are a royal priesthood, a kingdom of priests. And all together, we should find opportunity to encourage as long as the day is called today. Um, back in Exodus chapter 16, and um, I, I think that, you know, I, I really was struggling with this genealogy. Um, I'm, I, there's a lot of things going on here, and I, I think it's helpful for individual study or small group study, but I was trying to understand, like, what's the purpose here? Because um, it just seems out of place, right? I mean, we're, 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 we're tracking with the story, and then all of a sudden, boom, genealogy. I mean, have you ever been to, a, like, reading through the scriptures, and then you just get a long list of names, and you're like, skip, right? I can't pronounce these, skip. I mean, what's the point? What's the point? Why? And for the Israelite reader who is hearing this the first time, um, this isn't abnormal. It actually is very intentional. And so I'm not going to read through the genealogy, but I am going to make some highlights here, because I think it ties into this whole theme that we've been developing together this morning, that God wants to use broken people. And if you notice in the genealogy, um, starting in verse 10, you actually see that this genealogy is sandwiched behind two almost identical texts. Okay, so I'm going to highlight those two texts this morning. So in verse 10, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But again, verse 12, here's our um, reticent Moses, um, hesitant Moses. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Again, he's asking the wrong question. He's asking, who am I, rather than who is I am. And yet, what we see here, he goes, listen, um, the people aren't even listening to me. And I have to say this, because as a parent, I feel that sometimes when my kids aren't listening to me, I just, like, want to choke them. My, my <laughs> but, but, but think about it. You're just like, oh, they're not listening. But, but, but I, I, and I, this isn't perfect, but I've learned oftentimes that when they're not listening, it's because there's something going on, right? And, and I think Moses is missing it. And this is why I think God gives us this text here to say they did not listen because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. Sometimes my kids come home with a nasty little attitude from school, and it's like, all right, what's going on? And then usually it's like, what happened at school or what's going on? And sometimes it's just that they're tired, right? And it, does it excuse it? No, but it explains it, right? And so that's why the, 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 the doctor, when he comes in and he hears all of your symptoms, he doesn't go, well... He wants to hear all of about it to explain it so we can find the right diagnosis to help, help you and heal you. And I think that's what the Lord does, and I think that's what ultimately we should do as well, especially when, when there are um, people in our lives or, or kids, spouses, or anyone else, neighbors, that just, that just feel like they're just, it's a brick wall. What's going on under the, the hood? So, but look at this. Moses is going, they don't listen to me. Pharaoh's not going to listen to me, right? I mean, he thinks he's a god. He's not going to listen to me. And look, who am I? I am a man of uncircumcised lips. And you're like, what does that mean? 
I think it's the way of Moses here as the author saying two things. I'm not really a good talker, and the whole thing that we talked about last week with the circumcision of his son, he's going, listen, I got a past. I'm not a good talker. I, and, and it sandwiches this whole section of the genealogy with that phrase. I am of uncircumcised lips. And if you go back down to verse 26, look at this. He says, again, it's like repeating it. It sandwiches the genealogy. He goes, these are the Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their host. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt, this Moses and this Aaron. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am Yahweh, Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But look at verse 30. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? Do you hear it? I am broken. How will I get anything done for the Lord? And I think the reason why those two sandwich the genealogy is because here's the big idea of most genealogies in the Scripture. God works through broken people because there's no one else except broken people to work with. And this is why later in the scripture in the New Testament, it says that we have this treasure in what? Broken vessels, jars of clay. You see, this treasure that we have of the gospel, this treasure that we have of the, the spirit of God himself that we have it is in jars of clay. We are broken vessels, but we serve a big God, and he works through broken people. I mean, again, I don't have time to go through all of the different tra trails here, um, because I think at one perspective of this genealogy is that God is establishing Aaron because he will be um, the, the kind of fountainhead of the Levitical priesthood. And his son, Phineas, whom my son, Caleb Phineas, gets his name, mentioned in this, um, in Numbers chapter 25, continues this priesthood. So there's, there's other things going on here for sure. But I'm going to draw two things. He mentions people... Let me say it this way. He actually cuts out, it's not like, you know, dun, 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 with all of the names. He's intentionally putting different people at different places in the genealogy because there's a purpose behind it. It's like in Jesus' genealogy when he mentions Rahab. You're like, why did Rahab get a, you know, front and center position in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew? Do you guys remember who Rahab is? She was a prostitute. If you're trying to build a pedigree and a resume based upon your genealogy for Jesus the Messiah, why would you put in a prostitute? You wouldn't. Unless the whole point of the gospel is that God works through broken people. And at this point, we should all say amen because we're broken. And here, even in the genealogy of Moses and Aaron, um, in verse 20, this is an interesting um, little detail. In verse 20, it says, Amram took as his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. Now, um, you may not realize this, but later in the Levitical law, this was actually forbidden. In Leviticus let me find it here. In Leviticus 18.12, it says, Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. Oops. There's some brokenness. There's some messiness. And it actually even has Korah's... It mentions the Korites in this genealogy. And if you remember anything from Numbers and the story of the Exodus, who were those that rebelled against Aaron and Moses? It was the Korites, and they put them in here. And you have some good things, for sure. Phineas, it, it, it kind of highlights Phineas. But my point is, as we look through all of the genealogy that's in Scripture, I mean, for some of us, when we approach Scripture, we think, oh, these heroes of the faith. Really? David, man after God's own heart? Adulterer? Murderer? Coward? You're a coward. What? 
He went, he, instead of going to war, he stayed back, and that's how this whole thing happened. Abraham threw his wife under the bus, not once, but twice. Moses, we, we're, we're learning about Moses, right? What about um, Noah? Noah must have surely been a righteous man because God chose him to save people through the flood. Well, what happened after? He got sloppy drunk and naked, and honestly, some things happened probably that shouldn't. What? Maybe I am tearing down your view of some of these heroes of faith because the point is this. Not that you embrace your brokenness. The point is you're not afraid of your brokenness. Because I think that Moses was afraid of his brokenness. I think that the people of Israel were afraid of their brokenness. And what God is trying to communicate is, it's not about you. It's about me. This is about the Lord. I am the Lord. And that's why I'm saying this to you over and over and over again in this text. I am the Lord. I am the one. I am that I am. I'm going to use you. I'm going to invite you to be used and become a part of my story, but at the end of the day, it's not about you, because I'm working with broken vessels, but I saw fit that if I would put my treasure in jars of clay in these broken vessels, that I would shine forth the maximum glory for my name. And I don't know about you, but that's really good news, because that means everyone is invited to play. Everyone. Now, we have our, our stages or our degrees of brokenness, but we're all broken, And the quicker that we can come to the point of going, I'm broken, and we create humility in our heart, then Isaiah 66 comes into play, and we realize that it's there that God wants to establish his throne from the heart of a broken and contrite spirit. But there's just something about our pride that says, no, I refuse to be broken. I mean, I don't know if any of you ride horses, but the word actually from contrite is from like a broken horse. And Lynn probably knows this more than I. But when you see a wild stallion that's not yet broken, they're bucking all over the place. You can't control them. But when they are broken, they are contrite. And they can be yielded and used with a, for a purpose. That's the image of this idea that we're talking about. The Lord wants to break us. And, and, and this is in the sovereignty of the Lord. And sometimes our harsh circumstances and our sufferings, what do they do to us? They break us. Now you're saying, Pastor, that God, you know, wants us to go through pain and suffering. No, but I think sometimes he allows it to break our pride. Because at the end of the day, what is the best thing for us? him. And if our pride keeps us from him, then whatever it takes to break that pride will be a loving kindness from the Lord. Finally, I think the Lord wants to remind the people of God. He is the Lord and he will bring out them from under their burdens. He will deliver them from their slavery. He will redeem them. He will take them to be his covenant people. He will be their God. He will bring them into the land, and he will give it to them for a possession. It's seven I will statements in chapter six. And, you know, for the people of God, as they were looking back at the Exodus story, the Exodus story became... um, a living memorial and reminder of the faithfulness of God, that he did what he promised he said he would do. And so for centuries, the people of God would, would, would tell and retell the Exodus story. But remember, the Exodus story points to a greater Exodus. It points to another time in history when God intervened to show us just who he is. And honestly, it's much better than the Exodus story. And that's the gospel. Because Jesus himself would come to live a a, a pretty ordinary life and would suffer and have harsh circumstances. He, in fact, lived homeless for three years. And then he would go to the cross and be betrayed by his friend. He would lose his friend Lazarus to death. Yes, he raised him from the dead, but then Lazarus died, right? 
But then ultimately Jesus would go to the cross, suffer in our place, die for our sins, be buried in the grave and raised from the dead so that people from all generations could look back as the people of Israel look back on the Exodus. We look back on the gospel and go, he is faithful. He will deliver us. That's what the gospel is. And that's why we remember the gospel every week at communion, to remember the faithfulness of God, that he uses broken people. And that the mind-boggling beauty of the gospel is that God was broken in Christ to heal and use broken people. Right? Isn't that the amazing truth? This is what Jesus said in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the what? Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who know that they are bankrupt. Blessed are those who know that they are begging poor. Those who mourn over that, they are comforted by the gospel. Those are the people who are meek. And what is meekness? but power under control. It's being broken. It's being contrite. Meekness or a humble confidence comes from a person who knows their brokenness, comforted by the gospel, that produces in their heart what? Humility. And it's that that leads to hungering and thirsting after righteousness. It's that that leads to a pure heart. It's that 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 leads to a person extending mercy. It's that that leads to a peacemaker. And yes, sometimes that even leads to those to being persecuted. But see, this is how God transforms us. He uses us in our brokenness because he is a big God. Let's pray.